So beauty of everyday tools. That's just a simple GIF. And I want to start my talk with a confession. So my name is John, and I do typical web apps. If you, if you take a moment to appreciate the conveyor belt, the transformer where we can apply boilerplate or apply some custom code, where we add buttons, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm doing web apps. I'm doing that for around five years. I'm team lead at Rails Reactor. I'm co-organizing KeefJS event, Meetup. I'm Ryan Not School Keef, I did say that, and I'm part of Catan Sword community. If you have heard about us, it might be a good time to go to Catan's.org or maybe to Do. There, there is a topic with um, feedback of our Kiev students regarding our latest initiative, JS course. And yeah, I'm using this time and opportunity to do a shameless plug. If you want to give a talk at KeefJS, please contact us. It's either me or Andrew Listochkin, who I think a lot of you are familiar with. And recently we started doing some other initiatives at Catan's Fork Umbrella. So there is an open space in GitHub where you can come and propose whatever you think would be a good thing for a community, like running a free course, event, looking for someone to build a project with, etc. Please do. Uh, yeah, and one more thing regarding this slide. There is a link at the top of it. I'll be using Pointer a lot today. So there is a link at the top of it, which is actually linked to these slides on GitHub pages. They are now live, and if you have troubles following me or reading code, there will be some code. I won't lie, you might go just to the online version and follow me along. Alrighty, so web apps. I'm doing those. I must say that I'm not bashing at web apps. I do understand that a lot of web apps actually might be solving an important problem. They're helpful to business. They can actually be someone's genuine passion. So there are a lot of people who might be arguing all day regarding semantic layouts, the performance of the browser, the architecture of the application that should be used to display the form on the page in the best way. And there is a lot of looking down by other developers from other areas, at the web developers. And um, why, why is that? So basically, development in a nutshell, that's uh, some internet rant I, I took. It's in Russian, but I will translate it for you if you don't understand it. It's just about being able to show a list or its part add a, an item to the list, show that item in the list, so maybe change it, add it in some way, and just delete it, right? So it's not rocket science. We are not actually sending item in space. By the way, the, there is an open source NASA dashboard, which is used, uh, which can be used to track telemetry from actual rocket rockets in space, which is kind of cool. I think it's now in GitHub in open source. So yeah, back to web development in the nutshell. And if um, typical web dev would be asked, like, when was the last time you did use some sort of algorithm, data structure, et cetera, uh, there is this poll that was ran by uh, Michael Bortnik, Michael Bortnik, he's a good friend of mine. It's not too representative, as there are like 250 answers or something. But uh, basically, there are like 76%, 70 percent of web developers haven't been using algorithms for like half a year or something. And I would say that for the most of us, it might be that we are either not interested in that part of computer science and the area we are working in, or we are interested in that area when we are trying to get ready to the interview in some company where we are no we would be asked some, some algorithms, right? So why, why is that, right? Why is that in web development we have that situation? We usually won't be having a computer science background. We would be self-taught. Who here is self-taught web developer? Please raise your hand. Okay, not, not too much. I would say around like 30% of people would raise their hands. Others would be shaking. Like, no, actually, I'm not like that. Uh, we are solving the area, the domain of problems we are solving is actually not that hard, right? I did go over there. 
Um, the JavaScript itself being high-level languages means that we don't need to be too smart about how we use it, right? In Pascal, we would be, for example, just to find the biggest element in Pascal, you would go over a loop, do some sort of comparison, have a temporary item to store your max value, and then get it to swap two values. You will have to either to have a temporary value to, to use um, as a container for one of the values while you reassign them. Uh, right now, with the structuring, that could be as easy as array A comma B equals array B comma A, right? Not, not too much to think about. And that's leading to like the last point, the culture of reusing existing solutions, right? And packages, just being able to go to Stack Overflow and copy paste the first solution. I do know that a lot of you here, um, not like that, because you came to the conference, you eager to learn new things, you probably might be not doing that, but there are still a lot of like developers who would do that and they wouldn't be interested in what's going on inside that solution that they used. But it getting their task done, so that's, so that's works for them. Okay, so one other question, or maybe two other questions you might be asking, like why do we need algorithms? Well, there are like two possible solutions. One would help your like programming life and another one like your everyday life, I don't know if that makes sense, because when we are talking about programming life, right, if you don't know computer science, you don't know classical computer science problems, when you run into one problem, you won't be able to tell if that's, that's that exact problem that was solved like 60 years ago or something. Uh, there are a lot of white papers that are being, I would say, rediscovered, right? A lot of ideas are not novice in the field and given people wouldn't be learning from the history, they would be reinventing a wheel and we are going in spirals, you know, every, I don't know, like five, 15, who knows how many years. And uh, regarding like everyday chores, I took the simplest thing I could think of. Well, not the simplest, but it's close to life, so we'll, we'll run with it. So there are like 10 commits, uh, where the, and um, between two releases, for example. And we know that one of the commits broke something, right? There, there is a bomb inside the list of commits that we have. And we need to find one, right? What would be the quickest path? So there are possible alternatives. You can pick at random. You can go one by one. Or you can be smarter and like start by dividing everything into two halves, right? So in here you would see that we are picking the first commit, in second one we are picking like the middle commit, uh, and it actually shaves off half of the things right away. Right? Uh, we we do know that in that half, if test pass or we we can do a manual check, we see it's good. We know that uh, th there is no broken commit in that first half. Then we go on and break into half the second half. Uh, we do the check, and we know that, for example, it's good because we know. Like, that bump not there, then we select the last commit and we actually get to the to the broken commit. If we would go one by one, it would take us like seven iterations to get there. And the principle in here, it's actually like binary search. Yeah, right, it's, it's uh, the first, uh, the very first thing maybe you will learn in computer science class. And that's actually like git bisect. That's the tool that Git has built in in itself. How many of you have used Git by sec before for some reason? Yeah, there are like three, four, five, I don't know, something like that, hands. That might be a really useful tool that can save you a lot of time, especially if you are working with a big code base and there might be some regressions. So down the path you were not aware of and you will need to find those. Okay, yeah, so talking about Git. Um, I would be talking about that because uh, for my study project for one of the courses I was attending to so for several months, I kinda needed to re-implement the Git and I had to go over like its internals and it kind of fascinated me and that's why this talk. So everyone here should know about Git 
or at least hear, hear, have heard about that. So it's a version control system or content manager, the first word, source content manager that was created by Linux core developers. Usually it's said that Linus himself did it in like, I don't know, eight hours or something. And because of frustration that came from using all the other tools of that time. So, and it's based of storing the snapshot of trees, not divs, and like other popular alternatives of that time. And there was, there were some other improvements over other version control systems that actually led to get popularity, easy to use, and so forth and so on. Actually, I don't know whether you know it, but there is a, another tool called Monoton. It's really similar to what Git is doing, although it's more, like, it's faster. But it was there before Git was. So Git is partially inspired by that tool. Alrighty, so high level, if we talk about like really high level, Git is just, uh, is operating on DAG of commits that are tree representation of file system where everything is addressable by SHA1, um, yeah, SHA, SHA, SHA1 hashing is used for addressing almost everything. If it doesn't make too much sense, that means that my talk might be of some use for you. So DAG is directly a cyclic graph. So this pun doesn't make too much sense in uh, English as he would be Count Dracula, not Graph Dracula. But still, there are graphs. And what are graphs? They're just a set of vertices, right nodes, and edges connecting those or not connecting those. It can be used in multiple different areas like computer networks representing the roads in, in the actual geography electric circuits, finite state machines, dependency graph, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, well, there are different type of graphs and they really b depend on how the graph is supposed to be used. There are downsides and upsides to, um, to different representations of the graphs. I won't be talking about those now. And different type of graphs can be used for different tasks. For example, they can have direction, right? So the connection is, can be one way and then um, every arrow or edge would be connected in the nodes only one way. That would be lead to directed graph, or they can be working both ways. Then we are uh, talking about undirected graph. Okay, cycles. Cycles is something is characteristic of the graph when there is a loop inside of graph. It can be either one node pointed to itself or some sort of loop that you, you can see in the graph. So based on that, uh, you can say that directed a cyclic graph, right? So it's graph without cycles, and it has direction to it, right? You cannot go both ways, but there is a specific parent-child um, relationship here, right? There are several main algorithms uh, or problems in graphs, which would be like shortest path, minimum spanning tree, Minimum spanning tree would be a tree that is uh, joining all the uh, all the vertices, right? And um, if there are weights to the vertices, it also would comprise the minimum weight in total and joining all the vertices. And maximum floor problem that would be something when you have capacity to your vertices, like the maximum amount of um, I don't know, cars that can go through the road. The maximum flaw problem would be like show, finding uh, the best way and the maximum optima you can just uh, get through your network. Okay, uh, going on, like graphs, gates, how do you know like that graph is working? No, git is working with graphs, sorry. Uh, just simply running git log, dash dash graph, dash dash one light, dash dash decorate, you would get this fancy representation of your commits, right? Where there, are, there is main line and there are other branches that are branching from the main branch, right? And they are kind of converging, diverging, all that sort of fancy stuff. It's not the most complicated project ever. Uh, it could be much more fancier if you take a look, for example, at GitLab or something. I recall there was a recent article by GitLab front-end developer regarding Git. 
and, and there were some nice screenshots to that article using graphs in GitLab. Alrighty, so mm, that that would be graphs like high level, but if we take a look at really small, we zoom in 10 hundred percent, we'll see like how does how that work. Whenever we create a feature, it's a separate graph. Uh, it's a separate branch reference to which is stored in special file in refs folder in your git folder. It would be saying that there is a commit that we created, for example. We didn't create that branch for, for no good reasons. So we created a commit. It, uh, its parent commit is in a master. Uh, then it can be the case that there were some new commits to the master and some new commits to the feature itself. Right, and then there are actually like two different ways of converging those branches. One would be merge, and merge is basically saying that for this commit, there would be two parents from now on. And if you take a look at the uh, big picture, it would mean that we'll have stitches. Not only like our first commit in the branch would be um, depending on ha or having parent from master branch, the final commit of the branch would have two parents. And if, if you take a look at that, that uh, me, would mean your merge commit, right? Merge commit is the commit that has multiple parents. And that would be like the application of merge, git merge commands in your git. Or you could rebase your feature. And rebasing your feature basically means, you know what, git, let's, let's forget all that, um, that happened in this branch. And instead of saying that it was forking from the master at commit A1. Let's pretend that we um, wrote all that code only after commit A2 in master branch happened. And for that, Git would go on, do some smart things, uh, rewrite the history. That's why you wouldn't be usually rebasing in master. Nobody should be rewriting the history in master branch. And uh, Mm, then getting you a streamlined, fancy branch with no merge commits. That's why some people would be arguing about like beauty of the Git history and saying that rebase should be applied always. There is a simple way to have your Git pool always do rebase. There is, um, first off, there is a flag Git pool minus minus or dash dash rebase that you can use to rebase when you pulling off differences from the remote origin. And you can set it in your configs that uh, Git pool would do that always by default. Alrighty. So that was a bit high level. It was a bit abstract. Let's talk about uh, actual bits and files and bytes that are stored in Git. Uh, there are several main files in Git, main files and folders, uh, main of which would be probably head. Objects and refs. I, I wouldn't be talking about everything else, anything else. So head would be just a simple file that would store a hash of the commit that is current, like head that is parent of current working index. There would be objects, which the directory which I would be talking of later on, and there is refs. Refs is a folder that keeps a lot of different files that are basically a name of the branch or tag, or whatever, and which would still have single item, which would be a commit it's pointing to. Basically, in your graph, you have a lot of labels, and those would be refs, which is short for references. Alrighty, so there are three types, three, three types of things that are stored in Git, which would be blobs, trees, and commits. And where do they actually go? Because like, I'm, I, I don't see anything regarding blobs, trees, commits. Well, uh, the truth is, it all goes to objects folder. I hope you can see it. If, uh, if you go to your objects folder and if you were running a Git project for a really long time, you would see like a whole lot, well, at least 255, well, maybe 255 if you're lucky enough, uh, folders which would start from 00, 0 to FF, right, hex. And each one of that would have uh, just a simple file, which would be labeled with 38 characters file name. So that would be a total of 40 hexagonal, 
digits. And that would be actually a product of hashing, right? So what is this hashing thing I'm talking about? We, did, we do hear a lot about hashes. Uh, we don't have too much information about hashes, or, or sorry, applications of hashes in JavaScript because instead of hashing, we usually use dictionaries or maps. And well, hashes is something you can think of that gets all sorts of different data and can just unify it in that way that it like represents it with fixed size, right? So like MD5 hash of files. It's a pity we can traverse that MD5, MDA5 hash and just have, you know, sharing a huge Blu-ray videos by just sharing a hash and just reversing that. But that's actually why hashes might be good for cryptographic storages for caching being cache key for some item or actually implementing a backend for hash structures. Uh, the hash data structure is usually, it, it can be backed by multiple different backends, primary arrays or a linked list, which are another primitive data structure you can read about. And basically, there are different way, uh, different hash functions that can be described by different characteristics, being uh, strong cryptographic or fast and performant hash collisions. Um, the hash functions themselves can be used to find similar or duplicated data items in some sort of data sets. Uh, th there are a lot of information mm, and a lot of different things in these topics. I would be giving away like two more keywords you might be interested in. Uh, reading yourself. So S H uh, A one, right? SHA one. Uh, it's cryptographic hash function. It was uh, developed by American uh, security agency, right? It's actually producing a twenty bytes hash value. It's using like five hundred twelve bits block. It's doing a lot of like it's doing a cycle of ending, XORing, rotating adding, taking um, division of two e e power 32 uh, around like 80 times to produce a final final stream, basically. Let, let, let's say it's, it's a final sequence of, of 20 bytes that can actually describe a any file and um, being cryptographic hash function in Git, it's being used for integrity. So basically, if you have a file of contents and you take SHA-1 from that, um, if you add another file it, and it's SHA-1 would be the same, Git wouldn't be storing another file, right? He, it would be reusing that based on uh, being able to address uh, the unique file contents by SHA-1. Alrighty. So th there are some other topics in hashing world that might be of interest for you regarding consistent hashing, perfect hash functions, hash collisions. I didn't talk about that. Right, aside from hashing itself, uh, the Git is uh, smart enough, or Git creators were smart enough, yeah, probably that, uh, to add compression to the storage of the data. They're using Zlib and Deflate algorithm, e, which is basically Hoffman plus LZ77. If you don't know like what any of this means, it might be the case that you might want to learn about uh, compressions and coding and coding algorithms. All right, so back to storing. We have blobs, trees, commits. So what, what are those? Uh, first off, given they are compressed and you cannot simply just open an object in GIF and read the contents, you can use this fancy or helpful uh, git command called git cat file minus p is for pretty print and then you provide a hash and you can read any item in your object database that git has stored for you. Right, so blobs. Blobs are basically the simplest items. They are content of the file itself. It doesn't store any metadata. It just blob the checksum length thing and the content of it. There is not, no, no file name in nothing. And file names are actually coming from trees. So if you go and take a look at the trees, any tree, uh, tree would represent some sort of some piece of your file file tree structure. It would say it would have a mode for, for the file, it would have the type, 
it, it would have a hash, you know, you see, like, right? Everything is coming together using the hashes and the name of the files, for example. It can be referencing another tree, which would be a folder uh, by, by itself, a hash itself. So we have blobs. Blobs are addressable we use in SHA-1. We, we have trees. Trees are using SHA-1, and they're being stored and referencing using SHA-1, and that would be a commit. So commit is basically referencing a tree by its hash, uh, some metadata information regarding parents, author, the, um, the committer, the commit message. Right? So, so that's it that Git has to offer regarding storage of the files. Yeah, so uh, there is information, ju 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 just some tip about storing the data in the Git. So Git isn't good enough or isn't good, isn't good fit to store big binary data. It's not good fit if you change a lot of unrelated files in different folders as it has to change all the trees. And whenever you change the tree, you need to change the parent tree reference in that tree and so forth and so on. And it might just produce too much other objects in your object directory, or trees. So, sorry, like objects in object directory. But let's say on that. Yeah, so in one book on Git, there are several good books about divs, uh, Git and its internals. That was saying that it seems like you can, you can throw together Git in a few working hours using some sort of bash scripts and mix of C. Right, so that's what I try to do. Um, the project I mentioned, I, I did call it Rocket, so um, I don't know why, but, but I, I love the name and I had this silly image I could use in this presentation. There is a GitHub link to it. It's not complete, I, I wouldn't lie to you, but you can see how using JavaScript you can create the simplified version of Git, right? So I didn't go all the way, and my trees would be simple JSON files that would uh, be represent a trees of a file structure, and uh, the nodes would be file names and the, or paths, and contents would be hashes, so, uh, addressing using hashes. All right, so yeah, let's talk about trees, and trees are basically um, type of graphs that um, could be recursively described as a root node that has multiple children nodes, each of it. Um, yeah, and some trees of, of children, so subtrees being a complete tree, uh, represented as a set of linked nodes. So you basically, this, uh, in this picture would be a tree structure described, nodes uh, and um, edges, and it's binary tree because it's uh, branching factor is two, right? So there is, each node has at most two children, although there can be times when you need to use different types of trees, and there are a lot of different types of trees out there, right? So uh, when would we be using trees or taking, looking at trees when we talk about DOM? Right, when we talk about AST, abstract syntax tree, file systems, indexes in, in the databases, sorting, I don't know, some sort of geometry, graphics, etc. There are different ways to represent a tree, and right now I'll be showing at least some code in JavaScript because this is JavaScript conference, so we can use hashes, list, or a master table to do the um, backend, and if you talk about hashes, that would be the simplest way to represent it. You'll have data attribute, which would store data and children, which would be just a property which might be an array with uh, appropriate nodes to it. Right, that could be a list, list of lists basically. So this is an array which has an item root and then an array of children. This array of, ch of, of children actually has like, oh sorry, has two arrays of children, like left and right. So uh, the first list also has uh, some other children's which are basically nested inside the array. Right, and there is an array. Given we know the branching factor, right? Because that's important, we can say that in this array, this vector of specific length, we, we would be storing our tree. Uh, but we need to know how many children might be on each level so that just provided the level and um, parent, we can calculate the offset and get the appropriate node, right? So it would be a simplest, simplest list. Why would people need so many different ways to represent such simple thing? Well, 
Mm, there are several main tasks used using trees, so it would be sorting, traversal, uh, and keeping constraints or binds in trees, which actually helps for sorting and better traversal. And traversal, is, there are two like main algorithms here, and you would hear, the, hear, hear those at some interviews, which would be the depth first search and breadth first search. If you take a look at uh, depth first search, it's basically uh, coming from the root node to the deepest possible path, and then uh, recursively going over those for every, every possible branch, right? And if you take a look at the implementation of that, if you have a list of lists, uh, DFC as easy as calling the function on the current root node, and then for each children just calling DFS, right? And if you try to do that, on our tree presented here, we just let, we'll get root ACDB, right? We are going deepest path first. And if we take a look at the same algorithm applied to tree that is just a vector, right? It's represented in the array. We'll have a lot of code. There is actually like a necessity to being able to address the offset. Uh, then we need to do some checks and we need to check whether we are inside tree still whether we can um, call our function needed on the current node and then on each of its respective children, left and right. And that's a lot of code. Well, not a lot, but compared to this, it seems overcomplicated. Uh, let's talk about BFS now. So BFS is basically, if in DFS we would go deepest for way first, in here, we'll go over like each level. So we can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? So the digits do tell the order. They are not random. And a breadth first uh, search, if you try to implement it uh, with our list of lists, we'll need to have a queue, right, in which we would put every, uh, children, ch every child of current node and then go over those loop and recursively add or not recursively, sorry, just can get the children of those nodes to the queue and working our way through the queue until it's empty and uh, console logging it. That would be like the list of lists, right? But if we take an array, that would be as easy as just iterating through the array. So read these sort of different representation makes sense uh, given the task you're solving. Same data structure, different representation, lead us to different results. All right, so um, just a side note, for initial implementation, I took a list of lists, right? And it turned out to be great pain, um, given uh, there were a task of adding things to the trees, removing things from the trees, modifying things in the trees, and with just simple arrays, it, it might be burdensome, but if, uh, after the, afterwards, I switched to just using hashes, right? And it turned out to work great for my use case. And my use case would be a file system where we have a single root node, but it can have multiple children, and we know, don't know the branching factor in advance. That's why hash did make sense. All right, so that was everything you had to know about Git storing, or at least at high level, right? But the, another important thing in Git uh, that we like and love, I don't know about you, but I do love it, is um, being able to um, render a diff between files, right? What you had, what you did, how, how, you, um, how the ch file changed, I don't know, folder. So that would be actually diffing, and that would be a computer science problem, classical computer science problem called sequence alignment. That's actually coming from uh, sequence alignment, um, the, like the most important application of those algorithms were when people were uh, researching DNAs, right? The sequence in the DNAs and the alignment of those groups of, I don't know, like four, four different elements. Okay, so yeah, so the solution, there are three main ways to solve this problem, and one of that would be like using dynamic programming and dynamic programming isn't just running on the thread mill and git pushing to, to some origin, but it's more of um, an approach of solving task 
using tables, right? So basically just being able to fill out the table. It doesn't make too much sense at first, but stick with me in just a few more seconds. So everybody knows this classic Fibonacci. And uh, we, we all know about this function. We usually will learn about it when, when someone talks about recursion and we go to the wiki page uh, and see it. So basically the Fibonacci um, function is a function that takes a number and returns um, like nth uh, member of Fibonacci sequence is sum of its two previous items in the sequence. Right, so to calculate that using your computer, because we are programmers, we would write some code. And we, if we do write in JavaScript like this, we would say like const fib uh, n uh, would be one if n is lesser or equals to one, and otherwise it would be Fibonacci n minus one plus Fibonacci n minus two. Right, and if you try to run it at 60,000, as an argument, we would get like maximum call stack is side exceeded, call stack size exceeded, sorry. And uh, that wouldn't be too good of a result. So yeah, let's try to, to, to first take a look why that. So if you take a look at the tree of calls, that would be Fibonacci 60,000. It would call Fibonacci f with argument of 59,999. And Fibonacci with 59,998. I wouldn't be calling those out loud because it's too, it's, it's too hard for me right now. So yeah, just saying that uh, there would be a subtree of calls. It would be um, almost bottomless. And uh, it would be the same calls for these two branches, right? And in here we can see uh, the, this set of calls would be similar, same of this one, but still, even those are the exact same calls, our program isn't smart enough to know that someone else is doing that job and it would be doing it itself and it, it, it just blows out the memory and the death of, of these calls. Okay, so let's apply dynamic programming. Yay, that's a simple technique. So we start, it's similar to memoization, actually, like, so we start with, mm, with the table of answers, and we say is for the nth element of sequence, if you don't have it in our answers, let's do a loop between like uh, after second element and up until n, and we are just summing up the, the items in this table, and we are returning an answer. It does work. It's not failing, it works really fast, and the answer is infinity and beyond. That's just because the way JavaScript numbers. Uh, work that precision. Alrighty, so uh, basic algo to develop a dynamic programming solution would be just identifying subtask of the main task, fill in the base case, right? So, so in here we did know that in our table there were at least two cases that we were able to fill in ourselves and they were used as a base for all other cases starting from that time on. Uh, finding the recurrent rule, right? So being able to say that n Fibonacci n equals Fibonacci n minus one plus Fibonacci n minus two, to be able to go through those subtasks up to the main task, filling out the table, backtracing past, etc. The last part is important when you need not only the answer but to know how, like how did you get to that answer and being able to display it in pretty way, right? So back to diffing because we started with talking about diffs. Uh, there is this algorithm um, called Willman Wunsch algorithm, and I would be showing straight the, the, the main meat from that algorithm that I implemented for showing divs, which is, isn't really fancy looking or effective, but it did work for my case. So basically, a recurrent formula we would be having is just uh, whenever we are in the table, we can first off insert a letter and not advance in one of our words, we can delete a letter, right? And that would mean that we, we will skip a letter in a second word and we can either edit the letter itself or keep it as is. So I do know that sounds hard and the pictures on next following slides won't help it. So 
Uh, all right, so this is a sequence. Uh, they, they're using the DNA, that's a, a vanilla image from a Wikipedia page. So we are trying to align these two sequences, right? We have the basic cases, basic cases uh, for uh, for top row would be like what would be what what would it be if we try to align nothing with that word and just add it one layer at a time and what would be like if we try to align this word with nothing and just delete it one one letter at a time. The numbers in here are actually like the score points that are used. And uh, this is related to actually uh, Levenstein distance if you are aware of that. So that score is being calculated based on, can be calculated based on this algorithm and this sequence alignment. So whenever we don't do anything, we just keep the letter. It means that we have no penalty, that's good. If we need to uh, to actually like add a number or sorry, add a letter, that would be a penalty of, uh, that should be minus one. So yeah, we're going from zero, the match is actually giving us the benefits, saying the good boys for doing the right choice here. A match, uh, mismatch, uh, then once again, it's a match. There is A and A, one to, to next to each other. There are possibilities that we'll have multiple ways of aligning the words, right? Sometimes you can skip the first word uh, so that you have some sequence aligned later on, or you can modify the first part and later on. You, you will still get the same amount of changes, right? And so forth and so on. So we are going from top to bottom. And when we are in right corner, we, we can backtrack. Like what was the way that we got to this alignment? And if I try to go with you know, like what I had, Mad skills, illustration. So I was trying to align two words. One is being gibberish hello, and another one being hello. I filled out my master table, and uh, the highlighted items are actually the items I was taking. And if I would be to represent it in reason, that would be uh, this result. So we are striking through one item, keeping two letters, then we actually need to add another letter and that we will get a final O. And that would be a Levenstein distance of two, I assume. Yeah, because there, oh, sorry. There are only two things that uh, we changed. All right, yeah. there are also different ways of aligning things. There are different ways to find the scores and based on that you can get different results. If you do know the, recent versions of Git, they, they have uh, this new heuristic for displaying divs, which makes it more readable divs. I don't recall the flags that needs to be used to, to have it, but that's really nice, look it up. All right, so being able to have dynamic functions and different scores will lead to different um, behavior of this function and different outputs. Right, so hello, hello. And yeah, so if you were to learn Git internals, you would learn about like hashing, compression, the graphs, the trees, the dynamic programming, and there are also some fancy magic Git does that you are not aware of, like de detecting file rename, right? So if it's just using objects and you move the file and then modify it, it still occasionally is able to know that there was a rename and it, it's not the, just a new file that came out of nowhere, which is really nice. Previously I thought it was because it was storing the divs of the files, but mm, occasionally uh, it, it turns out it, it doesn't. Uh, it does ref packs, it does uh, garbage collection, right? So whenever there are some items that are not accessible through any from any commit, it would just delete it and free up your space. And by the way, one other thing that you might learn from this talk, uh, which might be a useful thing, when you do a commit and then you do some sort of resetting hard to some other origin or branch and you think that your commit is lost, it actually isn't, right? So there is git lsk 
git lsk lost found or something like that command that can be used to, to find these dangling commits that are not accessible from anything. And until you do actually garbage collect everything, you will be able to retrieve that commit and those files change and that would be really, that might be really helpful to you. I hope it helps at some point. And yeah, so let's stop other devs looking down on Jazz devs. So Jazz devs are being web developers and they're being looked down by everyone who's doing backend work and other things. So yeah, let's learn new paradigms. Let's learn algorithms. Let's learn design patterns. And yeah, I think like if I were to try to send like some sort of short message, it would like be like learn core principles, don't learn technologies. And some other ideas of what might be interesting to you to look at if, if you got interested with algorithms, how like base64 works, right? So, so it's an easiest way to display a binary data as printable characters, which is really simple and it's really useful. It's used everywhere. Gzip, for example, if you're using React, how is actual React DOM diffing works? If you might have used D3, like have you ever wondered how is it doing these packing layouts or whatever? And um, there are some links to read about Git's, its origin, the mailing thread. It might be hilarious, it might be not. There are a lot of insights from Linus and other core developers about Git, their um, ideas about ideal version control system and like their thoughts about existing tools of that time. Git from the bottom up, Git magic, and yeah, so a lot of things here might be influenced by what I've learned from the projectors algorithm course, and this link is actually a repo in GitHub where all the lections are. There are a lot of um, reference to literature there are a lot of articles, books, etc., which might be of interest to you if you did get interest. And yeah, images were done by Shady Breeze. And that would be me concluding my talk. My name is John. I'm also known as Alex Lapshin. You can find me at Sudodoki Twitter handler, and that would be it. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> uh, just a couple of words. If you have any question, you can raise your hand, and we have volunteers on the left and on the right side, and they uh, give you a microphone. There is. Uh, hi, John. Uh, how it's possible to get such dead commits that are not attached to anything? Because uh, have you met this in your real life, in your real development life? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did do that. Oh. I had a useful batch alias somewhere in, in my ZSH config, which I didn't use for a long time. I will try to look up the exact command and just send it to you in, in the Gitter. Yeah. So, so it's basically just uh, uh, listing all the unreachable objects in all the trees, and it's just saying which branch, what, what, what's the commit hash. And that did help me out one time when, you know, like the, 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 this feeling when you're like, oh God, I screwed up all the day work for, for no good reason. I just wanted to do rebase so that my team lead would see a fancy uh, branch history. Yeah, so I, I, I'll just share it with you. Any other questions? Um, oh, there is at least one, yeah. No? No. Hmm. I I will repeat it. Yeah. So what's been the last thing you actually worked on using algorithm or things that could be named algorithm? Yeah, so the question was um whether I was the person who placed uh, themselves in the backend who used algorithms every day. 
And if so, what was the last thing I did with algorithms? So the answer is no. The image you see with the Twitter poll and one item being active, it's not because I voted for that, but because the poll was ended and that was the most popular answer. And the last thing I did with algorithms was actually this little project. And before that, um, I don't know, occasionally there are things that, um, as it turned out later on, were computer science project like um, rendering a divs. It was actually not divs in sense of code divs, but a uh, red line for lawyers, right? One, one time we did R&D for that task and given not too many of us knew about sequence alignment right away and we just f found few red implementations on the GitHub, we left it at it. Like, there is a ready-made solution, we can use that and everything would be great. Even not, not digging too much into it. Hope I did answer your question. Yeah. Any other questions? Hello. Uh, I want to ask about Git uh, hashes. So, is there any reason why Git uses hashes of actual commit data? Why just not use some random IDs? Okay. So the question here was uh, why are they using hashes and no, so not some random IDs? Right. So. Um, the hashes themselves are used not for the security, but for integrity, right? When you have a file, you can calculate the hash of it, and that would identify this file, right? Or this uh, commit, or this tree, whatever. Whenever something on your hard drive fails, and that file becomes corrupted, the extra bytes or some bytes missing, Git would actually calculate the hash, see that it's mismatch, and it will alert you. And that's why that hash is bringing in integrity. One other thing would be, you cannot just rewrite a file on itself, because if you rewrite the file and you try to snoop it into someone else's git, uh, git repo, uh, it won't work. You need to modify the file, which will mean that you will modify the hash. You will modify the tree that has this hash, and the hash of this tree would modify, and you will need to be able to modify the commit that is referring to this tree, which is actually being a hash, and then there is every other hash that is referencing this hash would be needed to be like modified as well, right? So it's too much work to compromise Git, but Git isn't like secure. Uh, there are security concerns starting like several years back that there are uh, calculating powers, like some agencies have enough calculating powers to actually compromise Git. We are not sure like why would they do that, but they can. Yeah, I hope that did answer your question. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, if not, yeah, I'll, I'll be hanging around. If, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask me. And by the way, I do have cool stickers. I have no school stickers. I have no school Kio stickers. I have KFGS stickers and the Katan Sorg stickers. Yeah, thank you. You're a great crowd. <laughs>